works with John when it's a pen comes out and just sort of thing I gotta take the stick off. Well even that. Huh? Even, even that even that. Oh that's um you know what it is. Um I'm just getting a minute to do that. That's all. Just to come clean. So Welcome everybody to the continuation of the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting uh, today, uh, Tuesday, January 30th. We uh, met earlier in executive session to review um, and approve the uh, executive session minutes. Uh, we discussed uh, litigation for the strategy in respect to a petition of uh, LNG. We discussed the character of an individual and we considered the purchase, sale, and lease of some real property. So, um, in sticking with uh, form, uh, let's uh, start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Chair, you have to give your scouts to a date. Hmm? Oh, yeah. scouts. Scouts. oh, that's even better. Yes. Scouts. Yes. Please come forward. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Do you want to, do you want to uh, present the colors? No, let's go. Oh, okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so now's the time where we um, invite the uh, public up to um, share ideas, opinions, or ask uh, any questions regarding town government. Is there anybody in our audience today? And that's a great audience. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This is great, almost like planning board. Okay. Anybody want to come up? Anything? Moving on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ted Stone. Okay, first up, uh, we'd like to select uh, town, town solar lease and uh, power purchase agreement with the uh, Thomas McIntyre Town Barn, the DPW facility. The Board of Selectmen and Ken Driscoll, President and CEO of Select Energy Development, LLC, will review the progress in the installation of solar panels at the Thomas McGuire Town Barn. Solect has developed, designed, and is constructing a series of solar photovoltaic equipment integrated in the main electric service at the new DPW building with an estimated annual production of 89 to 95,000 kilowatt hours. Under this agreement, the town will pay zero dollars per kilowatt hour. Select will be owner of the solar system and any tax attributes that may arise as a result of this project through 10-year operation period. Mr. Chair, uh, given that I work for Select Energy, I'm recusing myself from this topic. Thank you. Excellent. Come on up, John, Ken. Yeah, I, I think the Archigan has given us a, uh, since it's, it's, it is your building, so we'll probably come up with it. Yes. I'm going to let John start because he's been on the, on the grounds just to give a quick update of where we're at and then I can tell where we're going to end up at. Really. Well, thank you very much. And, and through the chair, I just want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to Ken and the entire Solek team. They approached the town with an idea to put solar on top of our DPW facility, as you stated, at no cost to the town. And this is going to bring an amazing amount of free energy to the DPW, which will thereby lower our utility costs. And I have to say that the entire Solec team from top to bottom has been professional. They've been courteous. They've been working on the roof in the worst of conditions during snowstorms, having to shovel out the snow before they install the panels. So it's just been a pleasure and my, my gratitude and thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. So, uh, well, thanks everyone. It's been a long time since I've been in this um, um, venue. So, um, glad to be back. But um, 
John, I want to recognize John and his team and Dave Dottorio. They've been uh, great partners in getting this project done. Um, we are um, scheduled to be complete with construction of second week of February, and we hope to have the system turned on about March 1st, so in time for the summer sun. Uh, as John said, uh, I, you know, it was our pleasure to work with the town on donating the system. Um, we tried to do something while we had the new Marathon School, and uh, uh, we had Brendan's support, but we couldn't get that um, donation through, so uh, we thought this would be a great thing, and especially in light of uh, Tommy McIntyre, um, it couldn't have been for a better cause. Um, so um, we're excited to do it. Um, it's part of what we do here in town. We have, we've got a lot of employees here in town, so uh, it's, it's been our pleasure. And, uh, and I think over the life of the system, you know, estimate 20, 25 years, town could expect to save $250,000, $300,000 a year, or over the life of the system, 10 to 12000 a year um, in electric savings. So. Um, so uh, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, working with Norman's always a pleasure, um, you know, um, helping us move things along, um, getting through the contracts and some of those things. Even though we're donating it, um, it has to be done in the proper way. So, uh, so uh, recognition to John, Dave, and Norman. So thanks, thanks to everybody. So. Thank you very much. Mr. Sturry. Uh, Mr. Kamala, could you just uh, go over the contract, any details that we need to know of before before we agree to something like this, before we accept your donation? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I, again, overall, for the record, um, we, we, we went through the contract before, but I think in summary, it needs to be said over and over. Uh, and I, I, perhaps I, I, let me share a, a, a human story from, from our conversations with, with Solette. Uh, when we did our reference checks as part of doing our due diligence in reviewing the contract, we checked what other existing contracts solid is with other towns. And all of them, they were charging some rate for the electricity. We're proud to say that in this contract, we're paying zero cents per kilowatt. I think that needs to be said. And then secondly, uh, this is a 10-year contract, so that owns the infrastructure. They will maintain the infrastructure. And as part of this contract, we made sure that they were not going to do the penetrations through the roof, but anchor this responsibly, which they did. Um, we also built into the contract uh, a clause that basically says at the end of the 10-year uh, lease, the town will assume the system at $1. Wow. Yes. And then um, what, what also <coughs> needs to be said, too, uh, is that in the contract, we worked out language where Select will provide technical advice during the term of the contract, as well as post the 10 years, Select is willing to work with the town in terms of maintenance, management of the system, and reporting. By the way, it needs to be said also, we have another arrangement with Solet where Solet is providing us technical expertise and advice in reporting our PPA agreement at the Holliston project. That has gone very well. So we're confident that after 10 years, we'll continue to receive that service. So, this is a contract that um, at this point is, is not costing the town any money. May cost the town $1 at the end of the 10 years. And then we have agreed with Select that at the end of the 10 years for a nominal fee, I think when we looked at the numbers, and I'm going to hold Ken to this, uh, it will not be anything beyond 1500 bucks per year to help us with the maintenance mm -hmm. going forward. Great. Well, Ken, um, you know, your contributions to the community. Uh, this is horrible. Your contributions to the community of, um, you know, really there, there's a laundry list uh, ranging, I'm sure, from even before you were involved in the basketball program, uh, being on Parks and Rec, uh, even after you and your wife uh, moved your residence out of our community, you were, I'm going to say, gracious enough. Uh, you know, we were lucky enough that you 
still maintained your businesses in the community, uh, both you and Laura. Uh, we see your contributions at the Gateway Green uh, project. Uh, this is just one more in a list of ways that you contribute to uh, Hopkinton, uh, even though you, know, you don't have to, <laughs> which I think is a, it's a testament to you and your character. Uh, I'm hoping it's a testament also to the community of Hopkinton and uh, you know what what you may feel uh, it's it's done for you and, and given you um, but uh, it's fantastic to have people like you who, who just give back without giving it a second thought so thank you very much Todd thanks and uh, it's easy to do um, we raised our family here our two daughters and uh, it's been a great community and we're we're happy to be part of it and we're fortunate that we can do this so thanks yeah. well thanks so I did work with Ken a little bit on another project that unfortunately didn't get to go through. Um, but so most people watching it on TV in the audience, they don't get what Hopkinton used to be as far as people that would come together, people that would do things for the town, strictly for the town. And Ken's a throwback. Um, I know a lot of the stuff that Ken has done throughout the years um, that others, that everybody knows, and I know that there's a lot of stuff that he did um, that no one knows. So he mentioned Tommy McIntyre. <coughs> um, so Ken, I put in the similar category as Tommy McIntyre. He wants to go out and he wants to do things, and just to do things, not to get his name out there, not to get the acclamations, and, and not to get the pats on the back. He just does it for the best of Hopkinton. He doesn't do it for Select, he doesn't do it for Ken Driscoll, he does it for Hopkinton. So I can't tell you, like it's hard for me to express how appreciative I am of that, having you here in front of me to be able to say that. And I know that the power of my words doesn't convey how I'm feeling. So for me, thank you very much as a Selectman, but as someone that is seven generations from this town. It's great to have someone here like you. Even though you're not here anymore to live, we'd love to have you come back. <laughs> but I love making you squirm up there with your at with giving you the <laughs> accolades. So thank you very much um, for everything. From well, just for everything. I won't get into the everything. But thank you for everything, and uh, hopefully we can keep it going. And you know that you know um, my phone is always there for you if you ever need anything. Brendan, thanks. And uh, by the way, uh, having been an elected official and serving the town and looking around and seeing scout leaders and other folks, um, that's what this town's about. So, you know, uh, I'm glad I can do my part. So, you know, and thank you all for doing your part because knowing you for as long as I have, um, I, I know the commitment and the hard work that goes into, you know, sitting up here, you know, for a few hours on, you know, a Tuesday night. So uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Sestari and Mr. Ted Stone have stolen a lot of what I wanted to say, but, you know, again, Ken, on a personal level, knowing you for a long time and serving with you, working with you on various boards and seeing what you've always done for this community, um, I'm just so impressed that, you know, even though you are no longer a Hopkinton resident, you've never stopped loving this town, you've never stopped giving of yourself and giving back to it. And um, this is just, just a wonderful, wonderful thing you've done for us. So I want to say thank you, and uh, thank you for making the sun shine on Hopkinton. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Claire. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. You're up. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> There's an ancient Aramaic term called dianu, and... Um, um, we say it at Passover at my house. And Dayenu, roughly translated, means it would have sufficed. And, you know, having you as a great neighbor, it would have sufficed. Having you raise such great role model daughters, it would have sufficed. My daughters, I looked up to your daughters, and they were just great role models. You know, then having you on Parks and Rec and doing such a great job in Parks and Rec, and then coming back and putting your company here and, and building rebuilding that area and making it, uh, making that farm a, a, a nice place right across the street from our schools. 
and now you know with with this this donation to the to the town it's just amazing and um, uh, you just keep just just like you said you're in you're a, uh, you're in the Tommy McIntyre mold and 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 the town really appreciates it you know it, it, my, my father always said you're not truly successful till you give back and my gosh you're giving back and it's totally appreciated Thank you so very much. Yeah, Tom, thanks. And uh, I, like I said before, I, you know, part of my thing, I've been given great opportunity in life. And, um, and you know, and what's been given to me, I don't think I could give back enough. I just don't think I can. And so I'm fortunate that we c can do things, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it kind of makes me, you know, gets me up in the morning. So thanks. Appreciate it. Now that you embarrassed me, I appreciate that. <laughs> That's what this wasn't about, but thank you. And um, I know you got a lot of business to do, so I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. I could say a few words in Mr. Hers, uh, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us workplace. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, John. How did you? Thank you. Hey, Thanks. Ken, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. And also, so for, for, for the board's sake and also for the public's sake, select paid for the permitting. They actually went above and beyond and installed two meters, mm -hmm. one that will allow us to monitor the electricity coming in, as well as the electricity that the utility companies, they called Eversource, may charge us. Thank you for doing that. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. R, would you like to come back and join us? Yeah. Yeah. Now this is something I, I am in error. I, this is something I, I wanted to do before we started, but um, sometimes I get a little caught up. And I would really like to have a, a moment of silence for Rick McMillan. Uh, he died on January twentieth uh, of this year. He was uh, thirty-five years at the Hopkinton Fire Department and being chief from nineteen eighty-eight to nineteen ninety-seven. He was a veteran of the U.S. Army. And um, he was a brother uh, Freemason of mine. Um, I'd like to uh, have a, a moment of silence, if I may. Thank you very much. I did work with him, and I will say a few things. I don't have to say much. Most of the stuff I said, we said uh, in our group of uh, firefighters at his wake. Um, Chief was a good guy. <clears throat> the Chief taught me a lot about firefighting, but the Chief taught me a lot more about being a good guy. And uh, I owe a lot to the Chief. Um, he was... Uh, he was the, one of the first people that I dealt with in a paramilitary organization that I had to learn to say sir or chief. And uh, I learned an awful lot from him. He was a, a very good guy. And as much as I enjoyed working with him on the fire department, uh, as I told his, um, his wife at the wake, um, when he would, after he had retired, he was working at Colella's. So I would go in for a pack of gum, and uh, I'd be there for three or four hours talking with the chief. Mm -hmm. And the last conversation I had with the chief was just before I walked up to the podium for my first town meeting as a selectman, and he literally grabbed me by the arm and pulled me aside and gave me one last, how do you do, uh, about something that he was passionate about. And, uh, you know, he had ALS at the time. He, he passed away from ALS and he pulled me aside and I was this 18 year old kid looking up to this guy in a white helmet at that point when you know after the meeting I talked to him a little bit and and you know I, I, he he said you know the roles are reversed like you're my boss now and um, meant a lot but he was a, a great guy and uh, Another one of those, you know, I'm the big, I'm the guy that wants to talk about guys that grew up in town, and he's a townie, and he did it. He was a firefighter, and he did everything he did in town from his heart for the good of t the town and not for the good of Rick McMillan. He did it for his family and for the town. He's a, he's a guy you can't replace. He, he's a great guy, and we'll miss him.
Anybody else? I, I, you know, um, Rick McMillan was 100% Hopkinton. He uh, grew up here, he worked his way up. Um, he just never stopped loving this town, never stopped giving back to this town until the day he died. And uh, there was a wonderful outpouring at the calling hours for him. And I just saw so much honor and respect um, and admiration expressed in, in those rooms that afternoon. And I think the one thing that I felt the most was realizing how much he was beloved in this town. He, he was that kind of a person. And, um, you know, I thought afterwards, we as a town are poor having lost Rick McMillan. But one thing that uh, you can't take away and that will last forever is how much richer we are having had him. Yeah, I mean, it's all been said, but it's it's never easy to lose the great ones. He was one of those. Steve, do you have anything? I know that we're out of order, but you were you were uh, had attention when I was there. No, I just um, you know like. Uh, your support when you have times like this in an organization to see the town support that's the neat thing about being in Hopkinton so the family really felt the appreciation of all the people that came in um, even people that weren't a part of the fire department might not have known Rick directly but they a lot of people came in so thank you for your support too to see you all there appreciate it thanks Steve okay um, <clears throat> uh, consent agenda uh, minutes the board so consider approving the um, one sixteen eighteen board of selectmen minutes. Chair, I a motion to uh, accept the minutes. So, yeah, just go through the whole thing. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, we only have the two. Marathon fund requests. The Hopton Police Association two thousand dollars for buying fish stock at the pond. Hopton Sportsman Association for the annual kids fishing derby on Saturday of Mother's Day weekend two thousand eighteen. And again, the post prom committee for three thousand four hundred and thirty-two dollars for renting equipment for the post prom party on May 11, two thousand eighteen, from Paul's Rental for Games Delivery and Setup. Mr. Chair, I would like to note or question uh, a on the Hopkins Police Association. Is it a Scribner's error or is it twenty-five hundred dollars? It's two thousand. It's two thousand. I, I do know it's a Scribner's error. Everybody gets a fish this year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a swordfish. <laughs> yes, on a cruise. We'll buy all the hockey equipment the hockey team wants. <laughs> okay. So, uh, does anybody want to break anything out? Okay. Good to chair, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as stated. So, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Excellent. Okay, this is a, this is our favorite time of the year when these go up. And actually, the one great thing about Hopkinton is we do this several times a year. Um, Board of Selectmen will consider proclamations for Eagle Scouts for Troop One. This is such a great town. I mean, we have so many Eagle Scouts. We owe so much to the parents and to the troops. Um, how we, we can produce them, it's just incredible. I'm just so happy to do this one. Okay, so we've got uh, George Daniel Bradbury, Joseph Harrison, Gabriel Lopez, and Zachary Riddebush. Right. And we, oh right, we do. We have, um, right, we just got another one today. Uh, Nathaniel Shingleton. Yes, excess, we have five. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, come on up, <coughs> gentlemen. Sorry, we're just having an inspection, making sure everybody's 
in order. Okay. You said you did. Mr. Hood, you want to start us off? I think this is great. Five. Five in one night. And this probably makes about 15 this year. Does that sound about right? Maybe a little high? We've had a lot of folks come in, a lot of boys come in, young men come in for the Eagle Scout Award. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Eagle Scout Award uh, that we do here at the Board of Selectmen level. Um, what you've accomplished, what you're accomplishing in your life is nothing short of amazing. This is something you guys will talk about. You will put it on your resumes. It'll go on your college resumes. It'll go on your job resumes. When we interview people at Select Energy, there, I just said it. I said the name of the firm. If you put Eagle Scout on that resume, it catches my eye and it catches my colleagues' eyes. So this is something that will carry with you. You will carry it with you the rest of your lives and you should be extremely proud of all your hard work. We as a community are extremely proud, which is why we do this. We know your parents are proud and we know your troop leaders are proud and we're glad they're all here tonight too. Uh, I just congratulate all of you. Job <coughs> well done and uh, Hopkinton is for the better because of you and your parents and all that you've done for our community. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys sitting in the audience, you just saw Ken Driscoll come up and you saw what he's done to give back to Hopkinton. And you just heard what we just talked about with Fire Chief McMillan. You guys are the next generation of people to fill those shoes. And the fact that you have such conviction in doing what you've done thus far in your young adult age it makes me very confident that you guys can be this next generation coming up and the ones giving back and the ones leading by example. So great job. Congratulations on all your hard work. Um, oh, that's great. I like him there so the camera can't see me. <laughs> so you guys have done a, a great job. Congratulations, and um, thank you very much. Congrats. Thank you. Ms. Wright. Well, I had the wonderful honor of attending the Eagle Scout Court of Honor for four of these great young men, um, Joe Harrison, and uh, now I know it's not George, it's <coughs> Dan. Bradbury and Gabriel Lopez and Zach Ritterbush and um, delighted to see uh, Nate Singleton's, uh, that's fine, get your name right here, Singleton here tonight. Um, to Mr. Her's comment about how many Eagle Scouts we've had in Hopkinton, and that certainly speaks for our town and the quality of the leadership and the scouting organization in Hopkinton. But for those watching at home, um, I don't want that to mislead people into thinking that Eagle Scouts are given out like candy and that it's something easy to do. Um, I learned that only about 4% of young men who start out in scouting actually achieve the rank of Eagle Scout. So Hopkinton's numbers are unusual. And when you see these young men and you see the badges they have, all the projects they've done. They've done an outstanding Eagle Scout project to get here, but all that work doesn't just represent stuff. Um, that work represents the development of true character, um, what I would call the highest, uh, best qualities in man. Uh, they have needed to learn <coughs> and, and demonstrate commitment, trustworthiness, love of country, persistence, loyalty, strength, all the qual qualities that we, we want to see in our leaders. And um, I also, at a previous Eagle Scout commemoration, um, mentioned, and, and I will say it again, the board has already heard it, but for people wa watching at home, the Eagle Scout badge that they wear and the neckerchief has three colors, red, white, and blue on it. And the colors, demonstrate what these young men represent and the qualities that they express. Um, the white represents honor, which is a word 
the hardly <coughs> hear about today. It's a quality we really need. The blue represents loyalty, and the red says they are men of courage. And if we can continue to have young men like this in our society, we'll be okay. Congratulations. Honored to have you here tonight. Yeah, so Mr. Her and I, you know, we've been on the board for, I guess, nine years each now coming up. And, you know, this is, it really is one of our favorite things at our meetings is when we have the opportunity to meet uh, new Eagle Scouts, uh, hear all about how you got it, um, kind of compounding on, on uh, a point that Ms. Wright made. It's actually since 1912, 2% of eligible Scouts have actually attained the Eagle Scout status. So, you know, you're in, you're in great company. Um, it's a good sign, I think, for our society. In recent years, the numbers have been going up, and I think the last couple of years have been in the five to six percent range. But um, you know, you're you're in you're in great company. Um, it's it's I don't want it to be unfortunate. Usually, you know, we give uh, you guys a great opportunity, and I want to do that right now, where each of you just tells the board and the audience a bit about the projects that you did. Um, you know, if you guys could take turns, tell us about your project, tell us about any of the challenges you had in your project, and, uh, and just give you an opportunity to thank anybody in particular who helped you, you know, whether it's a local business, your parents, uh, fellow scouts, or anything like that. So if you'd each introduce yourself and then uh, take an opportunity to give us uh, a high level of your projects, that'd be great. You want to use the microphone? Sure. So, uh, my name is Zach Ritterbush. Uh, my project was over at College Rock down Route 85 towards Milford. Uh, it consisted of replacing the benches that were in the College Rock rock climbing area and also refurbishing the trail sign post as well as scrubbing graffiti off the rock wall face um, and uh, printing out some trail maps <coughs> and large size trail maps for the trail sign. Uh, that was the essence of the project. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Barnes of the Conservation Commission for helping me out with the project and, and representing the Conservation Commission, giving me the opportunity. Great. Thank you. I'm uh, Dan Bradbury. <coughs> um, my project was over, uh, it was called Wiley Woods Project. Um, it was over by Franklin Road. Um, on your way to Ashland. Uh, it consisted of installing two benches, uh, a 15-foot bridge, and um, trail clearing. Um, two people I'd like to thank were my dad and um, Karen Bo uh, Bograd. They both helped me a significant amount throughout the process. So. If I may, gentlemen, if there are any um, <coughs> Uh, town uh, companies that, that uh, helped you out with any um, materials or anything like that, feel free to give them, give them a shout out because you know, it's, it's good to have recognition. <coughs> I'm Nate Shingleton, in, uh, Faith Community Church in Hopkinton. I, uh, in the parking lot, I replaced all these uh, dead trees and plants these little islands in between the parking lot spaces to make it look nicer and uh, to help the greeting of new people. So we just replaced all those with ones that would live there and not die in the future. Replaced all the new mulch, put new grass in. I'd like to thank uh, Peter Mesit down at um, Western Nurseries in Oppington for uh, donations and uh, helping us plan everything out. Thank you very much. I'm Gabriel Lopez. Um, my project was on Carl Martin tra Trail. Um, mainly, it was of clear clearing up the trail of brush to make um, to meet um, Hopkinton Area Land Trust. Um, they own the trail, so to meet the requirement, it has to be arm's length of cutting the brush to make sure that you can actually see the trail. We also had had to install two. Um, replace one bench and then install a brand new one. 
um, it wasn't that bad. But we also had to, <laughs> we also had to install a 12 foot 12 foot bridge, remo- remove the old one because if you step on it, you'll fall through. But we well we put a brand new one on top, and some of these guys actually helped helped me in my project. And we also had to um, fix one more small small footbridge. We just had to replace one bore on it because it was like cracked in half through the middle. But overall, um, the biggest challenge was weather-wise because every single day it was raining, which was unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to th- thank my parents back here, Domingo and Mercedes. Um, they helped me so so much with it that I actually cannot thank him enough. And also like to thank Jeff Ferber for from Hopkinton Area Land Trust. He was he was the guy that gave me the opportunity to do it. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Harrison, and uh, my project was down by Lake Whitehall here in Hopkinton. Um, I decided to create a new picnic area near the boat ramp uh, where families can uh, picnic and I created a couple benches along the trail as well, uh, one of which being dedicated to a classmate of mine, uh, Brad, who passed away this past year. Um, It was a great project. I got a lot of help, um, especially from the Friends of Whitehall. Uh, They were crucial in helping me get permission from um, the Conservation Committee and all sorts of parts of the town. and. as well, the, uh, the uh, park rangers were a huge help in helping me plan and, and get everything done. Uh, lastly, I want to thank my dad. He was there every step of the way. So, thank you. So, guys, you know, you've, you've done all these, and you've helped to make Hopkinton a better place. Uh, you can see by how well decorated you are that you're dedicated to scouting, uh, and you've shown perseverance through a lot of challenges uh, while you've been scouts and uh, just by virtue of the fact that you found this goal and you found ways to help out your community and your dedication to the community it really does make you uh, leaders in your community today so uh, you know we want to thank you and uh, keep up the good work yeah and I'm just gonna follow on basically saying that um, this is only the beginning I hope Um, it was a it was a tough hurdle to, to, to get up to to become an Eagle Scout, but just you know, make this be the first step because as you were just saying, you guys are looked up to as leaders now and um, we just want to make sure that there's many in, uh, following in your footsteps and then just to keep achieving great things. Thank you very much. You want to go do, a, do these and uh, give out two photographs? Sure. Photo. <laughs>
Okay. If you want to get your How Government Works badge, you can stick around. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I thought we were going to continue having an audience. Uh, okay, <laughs> the Board of Select will, <laughs> will consider the following appointments. The Hopkins Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board. Applications have been received from... Um, of, would you help me with that, please? Yeah, Parvati. 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 Uh, and Angela uh, Ridelli. Uh, and then the Board of Registrar of Voters, reappointment of uh, Jeannie Wheeler Ristano, nominated by the Democratic Town Committee for a three year term to expire February 2020. <coughs> okay, so let's go with uh, RFID. Uh, yeah. Come on up. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Kamalo, how many spots are open? Um, <coughs> for the Affordable house, Housing Trust Fund. One second. I believe there's only two members right yeah. now. Yeah, we only have two members. Oh. We're trying to build up this committee. Okay. I, I, I believe that now that we have some response from the community, uh, this this is a good, good turn for this committee. Okay. Yeah. Is this that committee that didn't ever meet before? <coughs> no, that was the <coughs> Cultural <coughs> Council. No, no, it's no. this one. Yes. This one. And this one. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yes, uh, th thank you very much for coming. I, I, this is a, this is a um, committee that we hope actually starts to meet and, and um, uh, Utilize the funds and the and the um, the need. We have a need for it, and, and hopefully it'll with some new people on there. It'll actually uh, get moving because I think it's been about seven years or something. Yeah. But um, um, Mr. Hurd, do you have any questions or anything? Yeah, I'd love to have the candidate introduce herself and let us know of her interests in this in this committee, please. Sure. Um, first of all, my name is Parvati. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm working in Tufts Health Plan. Since two years, I moved from uh, Westboro to Hopkinton three years back. And then it's like the reason why I'm interested in this one because, I mean, like, you know, I grew up in India as a middle class family. Everybody wants, like, you know, our own home. And, like, you know, so now I'm in, like, you know, good position that I can buy my own home. And then, like, you know, I have a comfortable life. So. I know how it's difficult to get the job and how it's difficult to have a own house. So I know all these difficulties. So is there any way I can help the community? Because why should I choose the Hopkinton? Because I'm get, I have two kids. One is uh, going to fourth grade, one is in preschool. My younger one has some difficulties. But the school is giving like you know, such a good support for my kid. Like, I'm so, Im like, you know, I'm so impressed with their commitment and how they're supportive towards to my kid 
why shouldn't I give something to society? And then like, you know, I choose like to work to library. Right now I'm working as a volunteer during the weekends for two hours. But it's not satisfying because, you know, just putting the shelves, putting the books and shelves, it's not a cup of my tea. Like, you know, why should I do it? It's not going to help somebody. Mm -hmm. So again, like, you know, why should I join in this board? I can help only certain low income people or certain people with my money, but it's not going to reach out in like in a huge count. I need something where I can reach out to the more people and then I can help them. So that's why I would like to volunteer. So when I go through house is like you know, needed for everybody, especially it's hard for to for the low income people. So that's why I choose for this uh, volunteer position. So I've asked that question, I don't know, a thousand times <laughs> over the last nine or ten years that I've been involved in town government. <clears throat> that is the best answer yeah, I've yeah, ever gotten yeah, yeah. in ten years. Yeah, thank that you. was great. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your interest. And I'm really excited that you're here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I echo what Mr. Hurst said. Everything. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for volunteering. Tell your friends to volunteer. We need more volunteers. Oh, yeah, and sure. we need some qualified volunteers. And you certainly sound like you're a qualified volunteer. So thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Mr. Once I got to like you know know everything. So like you know, I'm kind of baby stepping. Like you know, I don't know much about it. Like you know, once I played like you know, I got a call from like and you know, I was trying to find it, like you know, what kind of information I can read it. I didn't get it but much of it. Like, you know, there are some laws or something. Maybe once I get in, like I will learn more, but right now I'm like, you know, baby Oh, scared. once you get in, you won't get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will keep you in. <laughs> okay. We have bridle that passion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that I think that the passion is is uh, well over half the requirement here, and um, you know, and after that, uh, I think that that's going to carry you through learning everything that you need to, and I think that we're lucky that. Uh, you decided to move to Hopkinton from Westboro. I did the same thing about 13, 14 years ago. And i um, happy to have you on board as a volunteer. Thank you. Yeah, now, Parvati, I, you just gave <clears throat> a great response. And I mean, just off the top, the idea that you love being here and you know you just want to find a way to give back to a community that's been good to you I mean that that's what we always want to see um, but when your answer to the question about why you selected this committee was was just spot on and um, it has I don't know if you know or not the committee's been a little bit moribund shall we say it hasn't really had much activity in in recent years and um, you know, we have fortunately with some new housing developments met our 10% affordable, so, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking to find other ways that we can still provide assistance beside that housing that's already been built. And I, and I think it takes some people joining a committee who are enthusiastic and want to find ways to, to get that committee active and fi find ways to, to accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish so I, I just think it's delightful that you've stepped up and you seem like a great fit to get that committee going again. Pavati, I, I will never mess up your name again I promise. <laughs> That's fine. Good you. You'll be there. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. This is, the, this is such a great and easy appointment. The yeah. chair will entertain a motion to appoint Pavati to uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So move. So move. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> just, just. Oh yes, Mr. For the board's sake, um, for a term that expires 6 30 19 to okay, your earlier question, this Thank is you. a five member board, and there are only two members, therefore three vacancies. <clears throat> Who are the two members existing? Okay. And is that the latest expiration term that we have open? It's two-year terms. They're two-year terms. And this is oh, appointed, not elected? Appointed. Appointed. What's elected? The it's housing authority? Yeah, housing votes. authority. <laughs> yeah, no, I've tried a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, well, okay, in, in, well while he's looking, while yep. he's looking, okay. all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstain? The motion passes. Okay, uh, is Angela here? Thank you, Parvati. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Angela's not here. Would you, you can email that to me. Okay. Um, I don't need it up front. Do, would you like to hold off on Angela, or would you like to... Um, I, think, I think that she's, if she's applied and she hasn't said that she doesn't want to... 
uh, re, you know, remove her application, as long as she's interested, this is going to be quick. Okay. Well, I, I will say that I looked at her application. She had filled it out yeah. more fully than Pravati, and she seemed to have some very good yes. financial background as yes. a CPA and chief financial officer. So, yeah. you know, certainly when you're mm -hmm. looking at, you know, the funds and, and where we might spend them and how we might spend them, she certainly seemed to have um, some good some good qualifications that could bring to that board. So, so the chair will entertain a motion to appoint uh, Angela to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund term expiring. What, May of 2019? June 30th. June 30th of? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion passes. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Now the. Uh, yes. The board members are Todd Sestari, Beth Malloy, Aman Hydra. Oh, so there are three. There are three, yes. And so this two will make a full board, is that right? Five? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And let's um, let's let's hope this uh, this board actually starts to meet. All right. So um, now the uh, board of registrars of voters, um, Ms. Ristano, uh, nominated by the Democratic Town Committee for a three-year term to expire February 2020. Um, so, um, Jail entertain a motion to uh, appoint. Is Jean here? Janine here? No. no. So this position, there is because of our partisan laws, <coughs> bylaws, uh, we have, we do get an appointment or a nomination from the Democratic Town Committee, and we get one from the Republican Town Committee routinely. So. And then, and really also the call. town clerk is the third, correct? Fourth. Fourth. So who's the third? Uh, Mayor. Sure. So it's. A four-member partisan balanced board. Uh, currently, we have two Democrats and one Republican, one unenrolled. Uh, Janine is one of our Democrats who's currently on seeking reappointment. And so the, uh, the other members are Christine Dietz, who's expiring in a few days, and uh, Veda Kerr, who's the Republican representative. So as a guy who works in healthcare, I try not to say that someone is expiring in the next couple of days. <laughs> Their term may be expiring in a couple of days. <laughs> For the record. We can. Yes. Okay. All right. And this would be balanced to keep the board balanced at this point as well, just so that everyone knows. Great. Thank you very much. That's better. Okay, so Chair, I'll entertain a motion to... Um, so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Okay. Moving right, moving right along. <coughs> special constable appointment. The Board of Selectmen may consider the appointment of Barry W. Sims as a special constable to a three-year term to expire June 30th, 2021. Yeah, I have a question on this one. This this person doesn't look like the, he lives in Hopkinton. And um, it looks like he's... Uh, Potentially lives in either Holliston or Framingham. Is that you? Come on up. Well, Mr. Kamala, can you is, is special constable different than usually the constable positions in town? They're an elected position. You run for it during the town election, and they're, to Mr. Tedstone's point, they're town residents. So is this this different category? Yes, and uh, there is no residency requirement. Uh, in the past, we have had individuals from out of town in the position. So, if, if I may, through you, Mr. Chair, point. just following up on that. So, if we have the elected constables, a full complement of those, where does the special constable come in? Are they just, if the others are unavailable, or do they serve a different function? Or, or can you just kind of, someone explain this position to us? No. Uh, Mr. Deacon. <coughs> um, so this was a discussion that I'm sure Todd recalls from kind of when they were discussing the charter and whether or not they were going to be making them appointed or, or elected or maintaining elected constables. And the option was to maintain elected constables, but that never got rid of the fact that we have had appointed constables 
the Board of Selectmen have the right by Mass General Law to appoint as many constables as they deem fit for periods of no longer than three years at a time. So they're interchangeable. Either can do. Yes, they both have the exact same powers. Just one group in Hopkinton, it's three individuals are elected by the people. And then I know of three right now, and this would be the fourth, who would be appointed by the Board of Selectmen. But they all have the exact same powers. How is it determined which constables are used in which situations? So it would be entirely up to whoever would take the, it would be using the constable services. Um, many constables join associations in order to get their names out there. Um, <coughs> and many appointed constables are required to be bonded as well. So there's different very degrees of uh, what you're looking for when you're getting a constable to serve civil notice or anything like that. Uh, I personally usually use the elected constables for the service of the warrant, but I could also use a uh, special constable as well. Okay. Anything? A couple of things. Wasn't Barry Sims uh, Oklahoma running back at one time? Mm -hmm. at like Detroit, a, yeah, unfortunately, Detroit if you Google my name, you, you don't get me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even look a little bit like no, me. No, not at all. <laughs> and, and you have a tough act to follow uh, after our prior uh, candidate for an appointed position uh, came before us. But I'm wondering, what is your interest in this job here in Hopkinton and um, sort of what what you feel you would bring to the party for us. Sure, yeah, I, I, uh, first of all, I appreciate just the opportunity to take up my application. Um, and, and although I have, at least up until now, thought that I've uh, volunteered a great deal in my town of Holliston over the last 40 years, after hearing Ken Driscoll, I feel a little bit like a pauper, but I'll try and do better. Um, I've been a, um, a constable for 15 years. Uh, I'm appointed in Holliston, Ashland. I was actually the first civilian constable appointed in Ashland. Up until that, up until that point, they had uh, police officers, which they found to not be legal. But in any event, um, I'm appointed in um, Framingham and in Webster. Um, and um, we have a group of five constables that work with us from Springfield to Boston. So it's a real company, Metro West Constable Service. Um, we've been doing work in Hopkinton because it's obviously adjoining, an adjoining town to all the towns that I do work in, but there are some things, as the clerk will tell you, that require an appointment in the community. Um, there are several ways to go about that. One is to ask you folks for an appointment, and the other is to go to court and get a 4C motion, which allows me to serve in Hopkinton. The preference, obviously, is to get an appointment in, in town because it provides you with a bond, as the clerk had said, um, that I have to provide the town. Um, as I said, I've been doing it for 15 years. I get, um, I have a good, good group of both attorneys and individuals who call on my services, and more and more often they've been asking me to serve in Hopkinton. And I felt at this point I had, there was enough volume for me to request an appointment in Holliston, or in Hopkinton. Um, my partner um, in the business is getting a little older and is an appointed Hopkinton constable. Um, he's now in Florida on vacation. Takes a lot more vacation than I do. So we're a little behind the ball in terms of being able to do service in Hopkinton because up until now I kind of relied on him to do Hopkinton. but. He's a little older than I am and taking more vacations. Um, in terms of my service to the community, uh, I established <coughs> the original uh, Holliston Access Cable System. I was president of that for years. I served the selectmen uh, as chair of the negotiating committee that negotiated all of the cable contracts, both with Comcast and their predecessor as well as uh, Verizon. I've done all of their contracts. Um, and and I, I think they're fairly decent contracts. I think most people have suggested they are. Uh, I represent the town uh, with the Keefe Tech School Committee. Uh, and I'm, the, I'm on the Marianne Morris Health um, 
Health Corporation uh, Board of Directors. Uh, so, as I say, I try and do a little bit for the town, but not quite as much as Ken. Um, the, the appointment in town would be significant for me. Um, as I say, I've spent a lot of time doing this job. I've taken as many classes as I could possibly take to learn the business. Uh, I've been at the Foxborough Police Department, the Leicester Police Department, uh, Randolph. Um, one other thing that, that I don't talk about a lot because I, I don't like to blow any smoke, but um, I find myself, unfortunately for my industry, one of the few constables that will deal with uh, those who are deemed indigent by the court. Um, there are a lot of folks that come to court that have to have papers served that can't afford my services. We don't charge a lot, but they still can't afford it. Yep. Somebody has to do those services. And my attitude is, you know, if you get an appointment or if you get a job that not everybody can do in town, I mean, not everybody without an appointment can do some of the things that I can do. You sort of have an obligation to help those who, in particular, can't afford your services. So I'm one of the few guys who takes all of the indigent work that the court uh, doles out. And that's just me. Um, you do as much as you can afford to do, basically. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up there. <laughs> Excellent. This is, sorry. Um, I don't, I don't think I have any in, any questions in particular. Who's your partner that, that does Nelson work Golden. Here? I'm sorry? Nelson Golden. Okay. And um, he was on the uh, Hopkins Police Force for a while. He's now an appointed uh, constable in town. Okay. And I'm assuming, I mean, I've never heard of any difficulties we've had with any of our constables. <coughs> I don't know if I should be looking at you. <laughs> I've never had any uh, complaints <coughs> in any of the towns that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't have any 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 specific questions. I mean, in my mind, uh, you know, I mean, we we have someone coming before us who, um, you know, is trying to take the more visible and, and public route to get permission to work in our town. Uh, as I look through the credentials and the things he's done for Holliston, and uh, you know, also look at the fact that we've had neighboring communities ask him to be on their police chief search committees and. You know things like that, and he served on those along with uh, with our chief. Um, I I can't possibly figure out how this would be harmful to the community uh, to to vote for this appointment. So, <coughs> Ms. Wright, uh, agreed. I don't have any questions, uh, Mr. Sims. Certainly, he's well he's well qualified, and it certainly seems an asset to have uh, a larger staff to choose from as needed. Uh, the only thing, well, for clarity, <coughs> uh, you're on the board of directors at the Marianne Morse. Uh, so, just for clarity, I'm one of the nurse managers there. So. Excellent. So, I don't know if I need to recuse myself from it or not. Well, this would be the, the nursing home, not the hospital. Yep. Yeah, okay. And by the way, I see it, you're worthy and well qualified. So, Mr. That's Chair, I move that the board approve uh, Barry Sims as special constable to a term to expire June 30th, 2021. Second. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Center School Reuse Advisory Team. The Center School Reuse Advisory Team will update the Board of Selectmen on its activities. A public opinion survey and a public forum scheduled for Saturday, February 3rd, 2018 at 10 a.m. in the Senior Center. <coughs> Enter and sign in, please, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, please, uh, I apologize for my voice. I've been fighting a cold, so I may end up deferring to my vice chair in a second. Um, I'm Rick Flannery. I'm the chair of the Center School Reuse uh, Advisory Team and Ken Weissmantles with me, he's the vice chair of the team. Um, just to kind of, as you said, update you on where we're at. Uh, the team was appointed by the board um, back in June of 2017. We've had seven public meetings uh, since that. Uh, one of the first things we did was to develop and distribute an internal questionnaire for town departments, boards, and committees uh, to basically get their input on 
what they felt were needs and possible uses for the center school building. Um, as everybody knows, as of, uh, as of September, probably this year, uh, the new Marathon building will be open, Marathon Elementary School will be opening on Hayden Road Street. And center School is going to become a town building once, uh, once they turn that over to us, probably right around July 1st. So um, we've worked to develop a, uh, for, first thanks to all the departments, boards, and committees that have, uh, have responded to us to give us valuable input. Um, we've worked to develop a team process and plan that identifies how the team will meet the charge from the Board of Selectmen. Um, the plan <coughs> the team considers to be a living document, that is, it's, it's constantly evolving uh, so that we, as we learn more about the process, about the project, we can update that plan. Um, it's going to guide us in a four-step process to determine a recommendation for the reuse of center school. Uh, we want to develop criteria. We want to in get public involvement, um, have an interim use recommendation and a final recommendation. And going back to the public involvement, one of the, the main reasons I'm here tonight is to make sure we get out uh, in, in another uh, uh, forum that we're going to be having a public forum this Saturday morning, uh, February 3rd at 10 a.m. at the Hopkins Senior Center. Um, it's going to be taped by HCAM, um, and we want to thank HCAM, especially Jim Cousins, for being uh, on board <coughs> with uh, helping us get that, uh, uh, that public forum taped and out to the public. Um, we've developed a public questionnaire, which has gone out on, uh, it's gone out on the, um, uh, town's website as well as being inserted into the Hopkins Independent as well as being uh, placed in uh, three town buildings. The town offices at 80 South Street, the Senior Center at 28 Mayhew Street, and <coughs> the town library on Main Street. Um, some thanks to uh, Elaine and uh, Josh Rossetti for helping us get together the, both the uh, paper um, survey and the electronic survey. Um, as of about two hours ago, between uh, ones that Elaine has got that are hard copies that she's had an intern enter, and <coughs> excuse me, and ones that have been uh, uh, entered by people through the electronic survey, we've already got 193 responses. So we're, we're pretty pleased with the response so far, and we're, uh, we, we can't wait to you know, see what response we get at the public forum on Saturday and what, um, what interest it generates to maybe even you know, boost the numbers more. Um, so we want to get as many um, ideas and visions for what the uh, future of this building is going to be and the grounds is going to be to, you know, to be able to present the board with a, 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 a well-informed and uh, uh, a vetted recommendation for you to consider. Um, one of the big things we wanted to do tonight was to give you an interim use recommendation. We don't believe that we're going to be done with this project by the, by the end of the fiscal year, and we anticipate we'll be probably going to at least December of 2018. So we wanted to recommend an interim use for you. Um, that interim recommendation, in, we wanted to uh, highlight some notes. We want to have budgeting for the upkeep of the building and grounds starting with FY19 to the town. Uh, school move of their property, um, the town manager, the vice chair, and a few other people, I think the uh, facilities director, are going to be meeting with the school people on February 6th to uh, have a meeting about how that's going to happen. Um, facilities for upkeep, we've been talking already with uh, the facilities director, Dave Del Torrio, about what is going to need to be done. We've had meetings with Dave Del Torrio and the uh, school facilities director Tim Person about um, how that transfer is going to take place. <coughs> uh, some short-term uses that we're recommending, uh, some te potential short-term uses for your consideration, some temporary record storage, other temporary uses that might generate revenue to offset maintenance, uh, marathon day use of the gym, cafeteria, and grounds by the BAA, and public use of classrooms and gym subject to determination of inspectional services of ADA compliance and zoning. And uh, on the grounds, the playground, the existing playground and field should be managed and maintained as a town neighborhood play space by Parks and Rec Commission until a final recommendation is made. So we're recommending also that the 
town manager have in his budget um, information for use by the center school, uh, professional um, assessment of the building condition, professional rough order of magnitude, uh, estimate to reconfigure the building for new town uses, and evaluate similar costs for new building for the same uses so that we have a comparison. And professional estimate of the cost of hazard mitigation and partial or a partial uh, uh, building demolition if needed. Uh, we'd like to note that we've had a tremendous level of cooperation um, uh, from both the town manager's uh, office and school department as well as the facilities directors from the town and the school um, in getting this project rolling. Anything you want to add, Mr. Vice Chair? The only thing I, well done. Uh, the only thing I'd like to do is encourage people to come on this Saturday at 10 o'clock. We're trying to develop the criteria, and this is the meeting where we're going to uh, get public input on the criteria that we as a committee have kind of brainstormed together with. Uh, and that criteria was in your uh, uh, plan as it is today. That is a living document. We're looking for public input on that. And the other major thing we hope to accomplish on Saturday is some brainstorming of possible ideas. We have the town committee's input to that, and we'd like to have everyone come and try to give their ideas as to what they think might work for the, 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 new, the new use. I, I found that the, the team is, is very open as to possibilities of how this building and the grounds are gonna be used. And what I've been saying to people who've talked to me about is, come, give your idea, fill out a survey. You don't know if your idea is gonna be that one that somebody says, aha, that's what we wanna do with that building. So I think as much as I can you know, encourage people, if you can't make, if you can't make the event, watch it on H Cam. Um, if you can't watch it on H Cam or make the event, fill out a survey, get us your thoughts and in, uh, in visions for this building. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a historic building. Um, it has a lot of potential for uses, and you know, there's, there's quite a bit of land that surrounds it too. So we want to <coughs> want to make sure that this, uh, whatever we end up deciding to do with this building, everybody's had an opportunity to have some input into how its, you know, how its uh, future is. Could you reiterate to the uh, uh, TV audience uh, when the surveys are due? Uh, we're going to leave the surveys open for about a week after the. Um, we've asked that they be returned by February 2nd um, on, the, on the paper ones. We're going to leave the electronic survey open, and we'll accept anything for up to a week afterwards. We want to give you know, some time for the program, to, you know, the, the public forum to sink in. And then once we do that, we're going to, with Elaine's help and Josh's help, we're going to be able to you know, um, go through the data, see if we can come up with a theme, and, and and then once we start to drill down on what the townspeople is, are suggesting for uses for the building, then we start to you know to narrow the public forums. So, would you like to open since you're on the on that committee? Would you like to? <coughs> add well, anything? you know, Rick, Rick and Ken did a great job. I just I just want to add. Um, yeah, if you can't make it, watch it on HCAM. I mean, if you really, really, really can't make it watch it on HCAM, but the whole purpose of this forum is participation. And, you know, please, please don't say, I'll just sit home in my bunny slippers and watch it on HCAM on a Saturday morning. We really, there's nothing like being there and having the give and take and talking to other people. And, and the whole purpose of this forum, why we're not just going with the surveys, is to get that public engagement. So, um, you know, I, I just certainly hope that Everybody will make a good er effort to attend. Um, we have not picked a snow date. I think we're just uh, figuring we'll <laughs> cross our fingers. Cross our fingers. It doesn't look too bad. Worst comes to worst, we'll get some up on the website or whatever, I guess. And, 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 to, and to speak to what you just said, one of the, one of the things that I, I think is we, when I was on the Charter Review Committee, <coughs> some of our best ideas yeah. came after we had public forums. and. People expressed it. We and we really got a sense of where the public was on a lot of these things, and we had some good ideas that showed up at these public forums. So I think it's that it's that important to, to stress. You know, if you can attend, attend. 
If you can't attend, make sure you get at least a survey to us to, you know, to make sure that your voice is heard. Mr. Sestari. Um, yeah, I don't have any specific questions. Uh, you know, it sounds like you guys are going about this in a very calculated way, which is great. Um, you know, it's a great committee, the people on there, uh, obviously, including the two of you and Ms. Wright. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to attend this weekend. I'm going to be at a volleyball tournament uh, in another town. But um, look forward to hearing some of the ideas that come forward, and I'll have another opportunity to give my opinions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, I'm actually going to try to make it there, but if I don't, Mr. Hur, if you would just cover your ears for a second. Um, an idea that I that has popped into my head is if you guys thought about renting the roof to solar to generate some revenue to the town? Um, everything's on the... Everything's on the table, depending upon. I think you know. I think we'd have to we'd have to check on the zoning, I mean, I would think that. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. But yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. So just that's my thing, and and to have uh, Claire and Ken and Fly uh, Chief Rick, sorry, um, going on the way back machine there, uh, on the committee. Um, it's it's nice to know that uh, you guys are there and, and and working for the best of the time. Thank you. There's a lot of talent and energy on this committee, and uh, they're making my job as a chair easy. Mr. Hurt. I always call him Chief Emeritus, and I call him Mr. Chairman Emeritus. <laughs> so, um, sure what they call you. <laughs> I, I've heard a couple of them. Um, Depends on the day. I think you guys are doing a great job. I was really pleased to see the sheet come in, the, the survey sheet come in on, on the independent, um, and I thought the questions were well asked, and they weren't biased towards public ownership or private ownership. I thought there was equal weight and time and so forth. Uh, so I think you're off to a really good start and I know you've done a lot of work to date. I'm sure there's a lot more to come. Uh, it's not an easy project you're working on, but uh, I think with you folks at the helm and with, some, with Mrs. Wright and the others, uh, we're, we've got it in good hands and I'm excited to uh, see what comes of it. I mean, it's, it goes without saying, it is the center of Hopkinton. It is historically significant. It's a nice piece of land. There are opportunities for revenue sources that I won't comment on. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we could do there. So, um, and still keep it, or maybe we do it with something with somebody else. I don't know, or public, private, who knows? But uh, keep at it, and thank you for the update. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> I was just really happy to hear that uh, you were talking about costing, because uh, you know there are so many people just so excited and really believe that. That when you were talking about the interim stuff, that oh, the second the school moves out, we're going to move right in, but not realizing that they have uh, the, the sinks are only uh, a foot and a half off the ground. It's like and watching that movie Uncle Buck. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, yeah, so it's just great to hear that. And then the comparison to make sure that uh, the town can actually afford to have this gem um, repolished and reset and and, uh, and and put back on the shelf. But great, thank you very much for coming and giving us the update. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on uh, on Saturday. Mr. Chair, one other quick thought, if I could, please. Yes. I heard someone mention uh, there's going to be a coordinated effort to move the school items out and over to the new school, et cetera. I mean, I don't know what the what the rush is to do that. Let's not create stress in town over that. I mean, if if the schools need to hang in there and store stuff in there for a little while, I mean, you know, yeah. we, we want to work it all out, but. It shouldn't be at noon on July one. You're out of here. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's expecting that. You know, the minute there, minute it turns July Great. one, the lock of the doors. I mean, it, it is to have that coordinated plan. So Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And, and there are organizations that um, uh, actually move this move stuff out that's uh, unwanted, and they donate it to uh, less fortunate school districts uh, uh, within the country and uh, outside the country. Excellent idea. We, we, point number two of the interim use recommendation that we provide you talks to both of the, that issue. Basically, uh, we're looking for maybe a memorandum of understanding between the school committee and the board of selectmen on the condition of the building. What, what, what are we going to get when, when we get it at, 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 at day one of the town? And then we believe that over the summer that they should, you know, can move it out there. I believe there's some plans by Parks and Rec to be using parts of the building during the summer for their summer class stuff <coughs> at this point. Um, Great. To, to Mr. Hurst's question, too, uh, 
there, the school department, an awful lot for Marathon is being bought new. So they are already doing an assessment of the existing furnishings in Center School to see what things they want. But an awful lot, they're not going to be used. The, the committee just wants to make sure, and, and I believe it is in the budgeting for the whole move to Marathon School, part of that will include disposing of unwanted items. What we don't want is a bunch of stuff to just be left, and now it's the town's problem to try to yeah. figure out to dispose of it. So they will be certainly doing that. And to your point about storage, um, in terms of interim, we are looking for a, a used building is always better off than a totally unused building if it's kept active in some way. So we are looking for opportunities for uses if it's storage or various, you know, things that that purposes that that building can continue to serve. So that that's not the point at all. It's more it's more um, you know making sure that things that are no longer needed are not <coughs> left behind. The problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kamalo, are we not doing number nine? Um, Maybe have to for just his meeting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a way back at the drawing board. Yeah. In fact, it's items number nine and ten. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the board as well as the appropriations committee and school committee for your time last night, uh, giving us some direction in terms of how to proceed um, <coughs> on the FY19 budget. Um, as I said, what what, we've, what I presented to the board so far are the requests that have come in. Um, your conversation last night was was helpful at least in in helping me think through what the town manager's recommended budget might look like um, it, it also uh, specifically generated a conversation uh, this morning amongst us as department heads uh, not including our, our school colleagues though we agreed that rather than coming to the board tonight to review the budget, we will meet uh, on Thursday morning, go through the budget, and then at a future selectment meeting, um, offer some, some suggestions on how to proceed collectively. Uh, we do realize that moving forward, what is important is for us to present a concerted effort. Uh, we, we believe that, number one, um, we are in this together. The solution has to come from us together collectively. And then also, secondly, we realize that uh, this, is, this is not a one-year issue. Uh, and therefore, what you'll be hearing from us um, are suggestions that, that go beyond just FY19. And so in terms of game plan, we will meet on Thursday. We'll come up with some suggestions in terms of the town side budget and then bring them forth to the next elements meeting. But we still have time. Time is not on our side. We're trying to get this done by uh, yes, the good. end of February. Yes. Right. OK. And then and number 10, the, um, the articles. Yeah, s similarly, um, that's 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 where we are. We shared with you the information based on the CIC votes, uh, as well as the CPC votes. We had some suggestions yesterday regarding what the free cash could be used for, uh, and we want to put that into the mix. Um, and what's our deadline? The the so deadline I'm, for I'm, I'm, I've been yes. spacing out oh, during your intro, so I apologize. Yes, no, I was actually going to address. There was a question that the board had asked in terms of the ballot question and how it relates to the town meeting process. Mm -hmm. The deadline for our town meeting articles is February sixth, six. Six. Yes. So that's next Friday, Thursday. Next. 
If the question is specific to the override, specific, it's specific <coughs> to whether or not we're going to put any of these articles on the warrant. Whether it's the nuisance bylaw, whether it's I don't know um, any any possible article that this that would be. Uh, put under this board's name, we would have to decide on and vote to put it on the warrant before the warrant closes next Tuesday. Or right. could we do it like the planning board and, and put a put a <coughs> spot on it and then still continue continue our discussion for the yeah. nuisance bylaw placeholder? Yeah, yeah. You, you, that's item number ten. Let's hold off on number ten, mm -hmm. if if we may. Uh, however, there was a question yesterday regarding whether. Uh, the board will need to put an override article in the town meeting warrant. Mm -hmm. The answer to that legally, it's not required. I think what has happened in the past is that... I told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the past, when the board has <laughs> considered underrides, uh, it was the viewpoint of the board that for transparency uh, that, and also to allow for broader discussion, that you felt it was necessary, uh, it was good practice to at least give town meeting uh, an opportunity to to review the answer, right? But it's not, again, the answer is you're not required to place an article regarding the override on the town meeting warrant. You're not, the, the, the way it shows, yeah, <coughs> the way it shows is remember the warrant has a first page that addresses the election. That's how it gets onto the warrant. I'm sorry, repeat that. The warrant includes on its first page mm -hmm. the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. And if there are any ballot questions, they are placed there. on that page. Okay. The deadline for submitting materials for that page is if there's a ballot question, it's based on, I think it's is it 35 days, so it's it'll be April 6th. Okay. And then the uh, the other election staff are so driven then by. So explain to me the process. Let's just let's just go hypothetical, mm -hmm. and it's determined at some point that we need to go for an override, yes. and we're going down that route where we're not. While the warrant's open, we're not putting an article on there mm -hmm. to keep that same transparency as we did for the underride. Mm -hmm. Now we get to a point where we're approving ballot questions. We put a ballot question on there for an override. Mm -hmm. Is there still a town meeting vote at annual town meeting? Is there still a vote to approve that override and no. then the ballot? No. Okay. I, I don't agree with that approach okay. at all. Um, because mm -hmm. I think that one of the things is people at town meeting, they're not thinking so much about the ballot question. You know, they're, they're looking at all these financial articles passing, whether it's for, uh, you know, whatever, land acquisitions or fire truck acquisitions or whatever it is, or the operating budget, and they're voting on it just, you know, looking at what they have on the, on the warrant. And then all of a sudden we have this ballot that happens, you know, a week and a half, two weeks later, and people are voting on this override. And I don't think it, I don't think it gets the same engagement. <clears throat> I think that if this board is going to recommend an override, we need to be 100% open and upfront with it. We need to have a full discussion at town meeting. People need to know that they're voting on that override at town meeting before they go and vote for any other capital expenditures, any other purchases <laughs> or improvements or anything like that. Anything less than that, I think, I think that that gets to the point of being deceitful. 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, not suggesting. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm not yeah. saying. I'm not suggesting you're trying to be deceitful. Okay. okay. Pain, no, no, no. But I, I'm not even. I'm not <laughs> even suggesting. I'm, yes, I'm not even <laughs> suggesting that. That's the way the board does. Yeah. What I explained is that legally, this is not how the I board is done. I understand legally. I, I also explained that, per past practice, the board has chosen to include it on the town meeting yeah. warrant. Thank you. To okay. allow for okay. discussion. Yeah. And and yeah. I don't. I, I'm yeah. sorry if I made any suggestion that yeah. you were trying it's to okay. say that we go about it in yeah. any underhanded way oh, yeah. uh, but uh, but I think that's that's my opinion is this needs to be if if it's going to happen it needs to be an article on the town yeah. meeting warrant there needs to be full discussion at, discussion at town meeting so that people can just take everything in at once while they're making their decisions over those four or five nights or we could fix our budget <laughs> and not have it to even have the conversation that, hey, that's my that's my preference that's my preference okay. but can I ask and I agree. I think town meeting, there needs to be some open discussion and town meeting's the way to do that. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. But if we did that, if we do that, if the vote for that fails at town meeting, you still go to the ballot and the ballot would override it. So a no vote at town meeting doesn't remove the ballot. <coughs> it's not binding. Okay. So it can fail at town meeting and still pass at the ballot box. No. No? No. You have to vote. Oh. If it fails a town meeting, it still is on the ballot, it doesn't matter. If it fails a town meeting, it's done. If it oh. passes a town meeting, then it still has to pass at the ballot. You have to have it's, both. You have to have, oh. Ooh. If it's an article at town meeting, a typical article, if it's just a discussion article on the front page, then that's a different story. But the budget, so, so the budget would have to pass for two and a half million dollars above what the levy limit would allow, okay, because that's where the money's going to be voted, and then it would have to have pass at the ballot. <laughs> But if that budget doesn't pass for some reason, someone comes up to make an amendment and says, no, I want a $2.5 million lower, then the amendment passes, and then we pass that new budget at that $2.5 million number lower, then the ballot is, is moved. I'm not going to argue with you. Based on last night's performance, <laughs> I would suggest not. <laughs> I learned everything I know and I don't know it's new. <laughs> you have to have both passing. And no. since we don't have a per, a, a, an article per se, for an override, like a two and a half million dollar override, we have a. What's the what's the best way to describe that article? I can't believe you <coughs> just said override. It's the last time I'm going to say. It. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, what would what would that article be if we actually did put that on the warrant? I'm actually pulling up the 2017 annual town meeting. Warrant. No, I, I yeah. understand what you're saying, and I mean I want the opportunity for public discussion which is what the, the town meeting process would provide. But, you know, we sometimes have 100 people, we're lucky, and to maybe get more when you're discussing that. But still, you know, one of the concerns about the town meeting has always been that all this stuff gets decided by 100 plus people. So, you know, <laughs> if we're in that kind of a financial situation um, and that gets decided by 100 people, it just seems like that's something that needs to be decided by only the town. Only a piece okay. of it will be, only a part of it will be decided by those 100 people. Right, but if they voted it down, then the larger community doesn't get to decide. I mean, that budget represents services. To your, to your point, Mrs. Wright, I agree with you, but it's like the people that complain who our president is. If they don't come out to town meeting, shame on them. We're not coming out to town meeting and I understand there are always issues people can always find a reason why not to go but it's sad when we have 16,000 people in our oh, town and we were scraping for a forum and um, <clears throat> you know I try to get the word out and I'm sure everybody here and, and, and tons of people it would be great to have standing room only I remember uh, I don't know how many years back it was 15 years back maybe that there were the auditorium was full. There were satellite, you know, satellite rooms it in the, in the school. school. It was yeah. definitely. It's a school book. And, they and, um, <laughs> and it's nice to have that problem, but, you know, if we only have 100 people out of 16,000 that show up to town meeting, if we know those same 100 people that are going to be there every year, and they're the ones that are making the decisions, the people that want to complain about it, it, it really, you lose all your juice. If you don't go and, and participate, you're losing all your juice. Oh, you don't have to lecture me on that. I'm just it's only nine thousand registered voters. Oh. 
<laughs> How many registered voters do we have, Mr. Tom Clark? I don't have my list on me right now. Yeah. It's uh, about 16,700 something. No, I'm sorry. sorry. No, it's about, um, right now it's about 9,800 yeah. something or other. I don't remember so the exact. So we get 1% of the people there. Point one. <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, anything additional? Not at this time, no. So, so where do we stand, Mr. Kamal? Are we? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just checking on Mr. Bright, Mr. Hare's last comment regarding whether a town meeting vote on the override is binding or non-binding. I mean, you know, the bottom line is I, I agree with Mr. Herr, you know, 100% that that what the target really needs to be is to avoid any need for it. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and, and getting a budget out there. You know, from from the discussion we had last night, uh, you know, if all the if all the data points hold firm, uh, then that's going to be a very difficult task to to meet. Uh, I'm hoping that some of those areas that are variable, you know, do change in our, in our direction. Um, but then, you know, if there's a chance or, it, you know, if, if it ends up that uh, we can't stick within what the levy limit is right now, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to do a big evaluation of, you know, what it is that, we're, that the town would be losing, uh, you know, by sticking under, the, under that levy limit. And if, you know, it's our responsibility it, that <clears throat> if we buy though, if we if we see those services as being critical, um, you know, we have to put it out there for people to vote on. You know, and not just make the decision as five people. Yeah. And, and I think we need to plan for a worst case scenario, and then hope that the news is better. But well, that's why we got that, and that's why we're delaying number nine. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah talking to but, right now. But, but if we're, so we're delaying number nine, but on number 10, you know, right. we have until exactly. next Tuesday, um, e essentially, to put a spot there uh, an art for an article on the warrant to discuss that override. Especially if, if we want to make that vote to uh, be binding. Yeah, and, and, and the board can discuss that tonight. Mm -hmm. and, Again, I, I, I've looked at the motion that was put in place for for the underwrite. It, it read as follows. We move that the town resolve to support an affirmative vote on the upcoming ballot question to reduce the amount of real estate and personal property taxes to be assessed for the upcoming fiscal year by 1.5 million. So clearly it was simply looking for support. But I think the motion for the budget article, <clears throat> if we have to get to that point, uh, the motion for the budget article will say to raise and appropriate through blah, 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 and including an override on the ballot on such and such a date to, to balance this budget. I think it would be in the motion for the article for the budget that this would surface and be debated. I mean, we've not done one of these in a long time. That's a good problem to have that we don't fully understand how an override goes through. But my sense is it's, good at it takes place in that vein. We're definitely the only town that's good at underwrites. That's right. <laughs> Which is why we're here. But we're, that's it's, and that's why we're doing a town meeting. We want everybody to have, we want full transparency. We want everybody to know what we're spending and what we're spending it on and why. Yeah, and, and town council has confirmed that the the town meeting vote on an override is non-binding. So the budget will get set in the budget article six or seven, whatever it is, it will get set. And if that, in order to balance that budget, the motion is going to have to include funding it through the override. It's going to be on the ballot at that time. And if the budget gets set and we don't need the money through the override, override then that ballot question becomes moot. But that That's ballot question does not be done right? to yeah. April, right? I, I, Oh, and as I've not seen how this, how Hopkinton did it in the past. The other communities I worked for, the override will be a separate article, and those towns have 
in fact, a practice where the, the budget is balanced at a special town meeting at a future well, date. Well, I don't yeah. want to get into all the different ways that we can figure yeah. this out down the road, but that is one of the ways. Uh, but from my vantage point, philosophically, I believe all democracy should live on, you know, live on the edge. And that's why I don't really want to go to that point, because there are other ways to solve this problem if, if this doesn't play out the way I think it should in the next two months. So, so <clears throat> whether it's whether it's um, voting tonight to put an article on the warrant, or whether it's using whatever our deadline is to uh, call for a special town meeting within the town meeting, and that having its own warrant, I think that any type of override discussion at town meeting needs to be taken up under a separate article from the regular budget. I think it needs to have that visibility. I think it needs to be separated out so that people understand that this is this is a big issue. It's not just, well, our budget was this and we went over uh, and then, you know, somebody's, you know, glossing through the warrant, trying to figure out is there anything really big that I need to go to town meeting for this year? We have a difficult enough time getting people there. Um, you know, we need to make sure that this that this is front and center, uh, if if it happens, and I'd be just as happy. You know, I'm just as happy as anybody else at the table here, and all the people in town, if we can avoid that situation. But uh, but I do think that it needs to be more spotlighted rather than just uh, you know kind of assumed because our number is higher than it should have been. So, <clears throat> Mr. Kamala, when do you see the um, uh, the budgets reconciled to some extent? Can that be done? By, can we? Do you want to have another? Want to have a meeting next Tuesday to, to decide? Do you want to do it? You know, rather than doing it today. You know, what I mean, can they? Can they, Can we give? Can we give the town departments a week to well, see where let, we let are? Let me ask. Let me ask yeah. this. So let's, let's do the scenario where this is handled if, again, it's all hypothetical, Mr. Hurt. So <laughs> um, if, if we were to go down the road of a special town meeting to address an override, can the special town meeting be held within the town meeting on the same night as the budget discussion? Yes. So that we do the budget article, then we break off into special town meeting, and then we handle the override article, then we come back, you know, we close that special town meeting out come back to annual town meeting and then continue on with you know buying dump trucks and whatever else yes that, okay that, that's so, that's how the special town so meeting happens. for me I'm yeah. comfortable with that I know that that buys us another four weeks or so before we have to have this discussion again mm -hmm. uh, and it gives us hopefully more clarity in the budget great okay so that also answers your question. Yes. So I was going to come back and say, again, to be clear, the discussion we're having on this Thursday is only on the town side budgets. Okay. So right. I can't offer that the budgets yeah, will be reconciled <coughs> without the school budget. Okay. Yes. Is that, is that and you know, I mean, That's I'm talking, that, no, that, that, no, know, no, I mean, but, but I, again, I, I again. I'm making the decisions yes. for the board. I, I, I just want to give all town departments enough time to do their best so we don't even have to discuss it. And if we can give them more than, than that week uh, coming up for February 6th, I, I, I'd feel much better. So I'll see that point, but raise you and say, after they do that, if they can't get to where we need to go, then I'd like us to have another crack at the apple uh, before we send it to appropriations and make some decisions on our own about specific line items and specific things uh, that are driving this budget. And, and see where that takes us to before we go to that path of other alternatives. Well, and I think that that's part of the meeting we discussed last night with the school committee and appropriations, where we all get back together and anything outside the levy capacity needs to be itemized and prioritized by both town and school, and then we'll have a discussion of, about all of those yeah, items. All that still has to continue as we go down this path. Um, right, and, and, and if we get to that point and uh, you know, it's determined that, okay, we're going to strike 
you know, whatever it is, all, all five of these items or 25 of these items, and that keeps us underneath the levy capacity, then hey, we're good to go. I mean, I think that's what we get elected to do in, in difficult years, and this is one of those years. So uh, the, our department heads are doing a fabulous <coughs> job in our community. Yeah. And their job is for, to manage their department as they see fit. Our job is to manage the entire community as the community sees fit through us. And I think that's where we have to go in and make some decisions on our own, and they're just going to have to live with them, whatever they are. So we can't abandon that process, even though we sort out what we can do inside of a regular town meeting, a special town meeting, and everything else. Yeah, I just want everybody to know exactly what's going on. And again, that's that's why we did did, did the underrides. Well, you guys did the, one, the first ones because we wanted everything to be transparent, and when. We were taking money that we wanted the town to know that uh, more money was being appropriated. Okay, is uh, everybody comfortable with that? With the uh, the raise on top of the action item. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we don't have to take any any kind of vote. No action required. The thinking is that if there's need for any warrant article it will be considered within the context of a special town meeting. Okay. Excellent. And that gives... And, Mr. and our deadline and our deadline for calling for a special town meeting is... April That's the ballot. That's yes. the ballot. The ballot. Yeah, and for calling a special town meeting is... I thought we said it was February something, or early March. Yeah, we got like four weeks. So, I, but I would also encourage the town manager to get with the moderator and make sure the moderator is uh, apprised of kind of where we are in this discussion about a possible special. Uh, I know that in years past, sometimes we don't want to, some people not want to go into a special as part of the annual. Uh, so I think we need to make sure that he's in this loop as well. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. Um, we're looking in answer to your question. We have to check the. We can get that answer by our next meeting. I know that okay. it's you know it's not something that we need to call for by February thirteenth. Uh, so if we have the answer on February thirteenth, we we're good. I just I just don't want us to get caught and find out that oh we're two days late. Uh, you know for calling a special town meeting. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and, and the, the other articles, though. The, the, are we going to put a placeholder in for the uh, nuisance bylaw? How many are there? Well, there's two, there's two, two, two draft versions in here. So no, I mean we, articles total that will have our name on it. Do we have that listing? I don't have the one. Yeah, I think it's in here. Okay, um, I can walk the board through the potential articles that we actually have brought to the board's attention over the last three or four meetings. Number one is the OPEP Trust. This will set up the the trust is now required statutorily in Massachusetts. And then number two, we will need another OPEP trust related article transferring the OPEP funds from the current account to this newly created trust fund. Three, Department of Revolving Funds by law. We have identified opportunities to create revolving accounts and one such opportunity is to address the $800,000 question that has come up from the school side uh, as well as other revolving funds that we've identified on the town side. And then we also mentioned at the last Board of Selectmen meeting the need to create a revolving fund to accommodate or to house the funds that we receive through the cable licenses. Land acquisitions. 
we have several land acquisitions that we've been discussing in executive session and we will need a placeholder for some of these articles. And then there's the head and row utility easement. Uh, this will grant an easement to Verizon and NSTAR Electric Company to locate poles, not double poles, poles and wires on town property along head and row uh, and said facilities will serve the new elementary school. You said NSTAR, I'm assuming you mean Eversource. Eversource, yes. Uh, and then finally, the nuisance bylaw. Uh, the board has looked at a couple options. Um, board does not need to decide on which one to pursue at this point. All we simply need is a placeholder um, article to move forward. So we're offering potentially eight articles. Um, and these are above and beyond the ones that are normally supported by by, by the board or sponsored by the board. Okay. Do we need action? Yeah, I mean, it may be helpful for the board to have a formal motion supporting the the eight articles in addition to the standard articles that are supported yeah, place by the board. Just for the articles. Exactly, for the eight articles. So the vote is to support placing these eight articles, or creating a placeholder for these eight art potential eight articles. Yes. And again, it's the OPEP Trust, OPEP Trust Fund Transfer, revolving funds, and the, revo and, and the revolving funds specifically for the uh, cable licenses, and then the departmental revolving fund bylaw. Uh, again, we, we there was conversation regarding creating a revolving fund for the athletic fields. Uh, we have also, in our offline discussions, uh, identified other revolving funds that could be added to the list. Normally, when we do revolving funds, we only have one placeholder article, and then we detail that when we develop the motions. Uh, lender positions, head and row utility easement, and the nuisance bylaw. And if it's a placeholder and we decide to take no action, or it's a placeholder and we decide we're not even going to pursue it, that's still a no action on town meeting floor once you create the placeholder, correct? No. If it's a placeholder that is removed from the warrant before the selectmen sign the warrant, it doesn't show up at town meeting. I move that we place the articles as placeholders as outlined by Mr. Kamal. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. So that was number 10. Number 11. Um, board invites. Liaison reports. Mr. Hurd, do you have anything? Uh, liaison reports. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend the MWRTA meeting the other day. I got <coughs> called to the meeting for work. Um, Framingham State's not here. So, no, I'm good for right now. Thanks. Same. Sorry. Also. Oh, you heard most of the center school review <laughs> stuff. So, um, the only other thing is I have been attending the meetings of working with the Historic District Commission and the Permanent Building Committee. They are going back looking at the final result of the library for some little, little cleanup details to... Uh, Things like the green exit signs that are translucent, and you see green exit all night long. Those have been, those have been fixed, so we don't see that in the evenings. And uh, just just small small mass post construction details in the library, but nothing else. Excellent. And my only thing is the um, uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association meeting that I went to um, last weekend, and um, went to a great. Uh, <laughs> breakout session on uh, the um, underutilized state property. And uh, Mr. Kamala and Ms. Lazarus are looking around town for state property that's underutilized. And now the governor started a, uh, a group that uh, will uh, <coughs> allow towns to um, 
use it and then we'll, we'll take it over if, if necessary. So they're looking into some, some nice parcels that we might be able to uh, uh, take over. And it was really a great meeting because um, I started talking about some of the parcels that we had and uh, the woman that was running the meeting started saying, well, I was thinking about DOT, I was thinking about this. No, call me. Have the town manager call me. We'll, we'll definitely arrange for some help into some of these things. So it was, it was just great seeing the uh, how the state can really help municipalities when they uh, when they set it up correctly. Mr. Kamala, anything? Yeah, just the invites. Um, we included a listing for the board. Uh, Southwest Advisory Planning Committee Legislative Breakfast, February second, in Medway. Uh, the Sustainable Communities and Campuses Conference. Friday, April 27, uh, 27, 27th, 2018. And then the MMA Spring 2018 Supervisory Leadership Development Program, uh, March 2nd, March 6th, March, April 6th, 13th, 27th. Oh, the deadline has passed for registration. I'm assuming those who are interested contacted Maria. And then the State of Equity in Metro Boston Policy Agenda. Uh, February 7th on Wednesday. All right. Okay. Can we uh, jump right to the uh, town manager's report? Yes. Um, with your permission, I want to invite uh, Dev Del Torre to join the meeting. We thought it was helpful for, um, for the community as well as the board uh, to hear from us on actions taken so far post the mass DOT public hearing on the Main Street Corridor project. Um, we, at the, our internal project team met with our consultants to review the comments from the public hearing. Um, we are now in the process of uh, scheduling a meeting between the town team as well as mass DOT uh, to go over our understandings of the comments that came through. Uh, in the process, we also identified issues that we could act on immediately, and in fact, we'll be asking the board to vote on one of them. Uh, let me walk you through some of the things that we have worked on and have in some form formalized uh, by way of integrating them into the plan. Uh, number one, there was the whole discussion regarding Marathon Way. The preferred option was option number two, based on recommendations from the Historic District Commission. We want to integrate that into the plan pending a formal endorsement of that option by the Board of Selectmen. Number two. There was a specific request to look into accommodating the two-way bike lane. Sorry, Mr. Kamal, in the interest of time and efficiency, <laughs> should we take these one at a time? I think Marathon Way, we've kind of gone <coughs> around and around the merry-go-round. I'm comfortable that we're ready to take a vote on that. Is everyone else? Like moving along. Yeah. I'm sorry? It sure. would move things along, yeah, wouldn't well, it? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Chair, I want to entertain a motion to uh, support the. Uh, I'd like to see the. Make sure we. Dave, can you pull that up? Okay. Yeah. So it's parallel parking, an extended triangle. The bump out is there, which is new, correct? Down on the left side there. This? Well, that no, that's always. That's been there. Oh, that there? Yeah. So it's cut. Is it. Yeah, that's just that's a traffic calming. That's so when I go, go down there. They but it's new to the common. Yes. It's new to the common. Extension yes. of the common. Yes. Right. Yeah. right. Everybody's good with that, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. O on that point, there was a discussion regarding <coughs> how to treat the sidewalk yeah. uh, around that area. And they showed two different designs. First yeah. they showed this, and then they showed one with the, the, it was gone. So I don't know which one it is. Yes. Here's our thinking. Our thinking is to maintain the, the, the bump out as proposed. Right. Though with the understanding that if if we have the sidewalk on the edges of the bump out, people are going to look for the straight path. Right. Yes. And so they may not use the one around the bulb. They'll just walk across the one that you see closest to the edge of the existing common. Um, there are some benefits in, in, in having the two options. Um, however, we will find with 
Whatever the board suggests. <laughs> well, you know, it seems yeah. to me, we, I know, at the planning board, I was looking for less impervious, more grass. You don't yeah. want to put pavement when you don't yeah. need it. Yeah. And I just don't see who is going to bother to go around this stupid loop. Yeah. Where if they're going down the sidewalk, that's where they're going to go. So yeah. to me, it, it serves little purpose except to create more pavement, which we don't need. Or well, actually, it's, just, it's actually going to create a spot where people will walk across the street because it's the closest point. Well, they're supposed to walk across the street. Oh, I, that's, I, you're right. So you said, just said supposed to. Yeah. Right. But but somebody coming from the uh, common will walk across that bump out and then... To cross Main Street? To cross Main Street. Look how much closer it is. Well, then you don't want to encourage that. Uh, of course. So maybe we should so, put the side. So take it away. Exactly. All grass. So yeah. then it would be a granite curb kind of going around that yes. outside loop or whatever mm -hmm. that thing is there, like the granite curb around the rest of the common to the yeah. roadway. Mm -hmm. okay. But grass. But grass, grass. where that Sidewalk orange is on that bump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I move that the Board of Selectmen adopt and support uh, with the Mass DOT and the Federal Highway Administration and other <coughs> necessary entities. Uh, option three, correct me oh, if I'm option wrong. Two, two, option two, two, two. Uh, for Marathon Way to include the extension and or bump out on the left side of the plan there without the sidewalk, but without the sidewalk and just a granite curb on that outside yeah. perimeter. Well, I don't think yeah. we have to get into that. that yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Okay. I think that's the motion that I'd like to put on the table because that way it's very clear what the board voted when <coughs> Dave goes back to the Mass DOT. Yeah. Well, <coughs> may, may I just correct the wording? Without the sidewalk encircling the bump up. I mean, it's yeah. not without the sidewalk. Yeah. You want the sidewalk that goes across the bottom. That's correct. You don't want the part that encircles the That's correct. bump out. Do you so accept the friendly amendment? I accept it, and Mr. Kamalo, I'm sure yes. Ms. Lazarus will articulate so better and write that. Right. And I will still second. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Okay. Second issue we are now considering, and in fact, we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with the Upper Charles Trails Committee, is moving the two-lane um, bike path to the right side of Main Street eastbound. Okay. Remember, currently, when you get to the Main Street intersection, the bike lanes divide into two, one on the on either side of Main Street. What we heard was you would rather bring everything to the right-hand side <coughs> of Main Street eastbound. We're now looking into that. We're meeting with the Upper Charles Trails Committee tomorrow. So I'm not following you, Dave. Can you use your mouse to yep. kind of describe what that is? Currently, we have a, a two-way bike lane on the southerly side okay. of Main Street from Cedar and Grove to the Upper Trials Trail, which is a little off of this map. Okay. So yeah. It's a two-way bike lane this way. To the center once trail. Once you hit, yeah, once you hit the intersection, it splits to a one-way on both sides. Got it. Yeah. Um, we're proposing to carry that two-way bike lane across all the way up through to Hayden Road. Got so it. there won't yeah. be a bike lane, a separated bike lane on the northerly side of the road. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so, so the bike lane, like in front of the pharmacy and all that's all going away this it's all going to be on the yeah the separated side. bike lane will, will not be on the northerly side of, of main street it'll be two-way all the way through town um from from hayden row over to the upper charles trail yeah. to, to lumber town yeah. yeah so dave i have a question <clears throat> even on the um the, the um, western side of that main and cedar Will that two-lane bike path eliminate parking spots there? So I think of like a Ward's Barbershop that's, that's uh, right in the center of town where his entire business is run by those two or three parking spots in front of his, his house. And does this parking, uh, bike lane preclude any parking there now? I mean, I, I, a better way to describe it is you know, the right of way width that we have and everything that we're trying to put into it eliminates the parking. <laughs> um, the bike lane itself does not eliminate parking from being on adjacent to a two-way 
bike lane. Uh, should we be able to carry this through? Um, we, we could show spaces, parking spaces adjacent to the two-way bike lane, um, where those spaces fit within the right-of-way. If they take up eight, eight feet of right-of-way, eight and a half, um, yeah. every time you put a bike lane in. Um, so on top of, you know, the going along with carrying the two-way bike lane is there's other, there's other changes um, yes. that we have to make in order to do that. Um, so I think of, like, for instance, Ward's Barbershop, I think of Hopkin and Gourmet, uh, I think of, of the businesses that are on either side of the main street. You know, it, it, if we're trying to revitalize the, the center of town, I can't see how this e even closely revitalizes Ward's Barbershop or revitalizes Hopkin Gourmet or, or uh, the Thai restaurant there at, at, uh, across from Bill's Pizza. Um, or any of those, you know, the library. I just don't see how it, how it's re in our uh, ideals for uh, downtown revitalization. We are mindful of the project's impact on parking provision. Uh, we have initiated some conversation with the owner of the barber shop. Uh, we're trying to schedule a meeting. Uh, he has responded to emails. We're trying to schedule a meeting to see how we we could collaborate um, with him in addressing parking. Um, there are some we, we were looking for an opportunity to investigate uh, any any a, any likelihood of increasing the parking provision. Uh, at this point, we are not <coughs> making any assumptions about his private property. We would like to at least have a conversation with, with, with him. Um, in addition, as I said, there were three things that we're working on. The third thing that we're working on, and, and this is this is proving to be, uh, I, I think, perhaps um, one of the positive outcomes from, from the public hearing. Uh, in summary, there has been a, suggest a suggestion to add a right turning lane on Cedar Street approaching the Main Street intersection. We are working with our engineers to make that happen. <coughs> it might involve, we're making every effort to limit the changes to within the right of way. However, it, it appears that we may impact the gas station some way. Um, we're, 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 we're continuing to look into that. We have no intention of impacting the, the gas tanks and so forth, mm -hmm. or taking any, uh, any, any space or any portion of the property that is currently used for his businesses. Mm -hmm. um, we are also mindful of how this might impact subway. Um, we're minimizing that impact. We also realize that as you approach Subway, there are great changes, and therefore we, we, we don't want to get into an expensive venture here. However, this effort is in response to the feedback that we received at the public hearing. People said they want that retaining lane. What it has done, and Dave can explain this in more detail, it has opened up an opportunity to further enhance the efficiency of the intersection such that, such that the right lane that we had added, which is eastbound on Main Street in front of Town Hall, um, stretching all the way to the intersection, may no longer be necessary. Our engineers are very optimistic that that's the case. That means the parking that was lost in front of the uh, ice cream place uh, in the adjoining bill is Yogurt Beach. Um, um, may actually be restored. So this is this is this has opened up another opportunity. It enhances if we if we went that way, the engineers believe that they can structure the the timing of the intersection such that there may not be a need for the right turning lane eastbound. Dave. Yes, in in general, that's you know the concept. The removing one of the lanes coming. Westbound on Main Street. Right now we have a left turn 
a through and a right through. Um, VHB is looking at the impact of, of removing one of those, um, which also would allow removing the, the merge uh, that we have pretty much from the, the police station to here. <coughs> we, if you have two through lanes, you have to merge. I mean, everybody's seen it over at South Street, um, adjacent to Price Chopper. You go through the lights, you gotta, you end up merging together. You know, people are pretty, pretty good about it. Um, the occasional stock car race goes on over there. Right. <laughs> um, as good as Massachusetts drivers can be about it. <laughs> so it, it would allow. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have an escalator. Yeah. It, it allows removing yeah, a couple of those lanes. So in removing those lanes, the space that that provides now um, is what we're working with to put in the, the two way bike lane as well as to add some parking spaces back. You know, very initially, the, the, the you know, the clouded areas are, are spots where we could possibly get some parking back in these areas. And these have always been the critical areas, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, impacts, um, you know, we're trying not to, you know, we're all trying to stay within the right of way. Um, it seems counterintuitive, <coughs> but, you know, by adding a right turn lane here, um, it allows for a quicker green on this north-south which will allow for a longer green uh, east to west. So, you know, from an intersection grading standpoint, the HB believes it, it can be a, you know, a wash. Um, so, uh, again, the benefit is we accommodate the comment that was made strongly at the public hearing. There's the potential to improve the efficiency of the intersection. And also, additionally, there's uh, potential to restore parking uh, both before the intersection as well as post the intersection in front of the barber shop on the right hand side going westbound. So, again, it, it addressed you know, parking, parking, parking. We've been trying to everything what we can do to, to increase parking, you know, from adding new parking spaces to you know, everything else. Um, this is a good opportunity to possibly get some of those on street spaces back in these in this kind of critical three four hundred foot section um, yeah and before it gets presented or brought up with, with um you know bhb to actually develop plans um, which costs money in presenting it to mass dot um, looking for the the selectmen to provide some input and hopefully, you know, uh, approve us moving this concept through as it's a change to the original concept that you folks have voted on to move forward. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, again, it, we want to underscore the point that to accommodate the right turning lane, there will be an easement requirement at the gas service station. Uh, we don't believe that might be the case uh, at the uh, subway shop. Or com is it Cumberland Farms? <laughs> this Subway. Subway. Yeah, Subway. Yeah. So, so with all this sort of in play a little bit here, are you ready for this meeting specific to the the line, the easements, or whatever it is that MassDOT is looking for? Yes, we, we're coming to that. Um, we are ready for the meeting from the viewpoint of the easements that we have already identified. We will also discuss prospective easements that may be required in addition to the ones we have identified. We also want to be better understand the legal process. Is Ray attending that meeting? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So do we need a motion on this one to keep up to the due diligence? Um, I, I, again, we're looking for feedback. As Dev said, this is great. before we yeah before we ask the engineers to spend money, we wanted to hear your opinions on on the three concepts. Seems to me keeping the bike lanes kind of consistent throughout the whole process here, or the whole corridor, it makes the most sense. Coming in and then splitting, and whichever would, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. What yeah, else I, you got for us? That's it. That was easy. Yeah. Again, we, we are now, hopefully we're moving beyond the post 25% design stage. We will get more clarity in terms of the design details 
as well as identifying the non-participatory items, including lighting, landscaping, and so forth, will be settling. <coughs> we had a discussion regarding, <coughs> we had an internal discussion regarding undergrounding and how moving forward with undergrounding might impact the, the lighting design. And so we'll be going back to the Historic District uh, Commission to talk about their expectations uh, if we moved to a new uh, poll system for our lighting, what would the, the district uh, commission be, the historic district commission be recommending for us? Mr. Chair, at this time, could we take two minutes and just sort of refresh everybody, including those in the community that are a little confused still about this and the funding for this project? There's a lot of discussion out there about our tax dollars at play for this project. Yes, they are our tax dollars, but we have paid those tax dollars to the state. They're sitting in a fund, and they're going to come back to us for this project. And we paid federal tax dollars, and they're sitting in a fund, and they're going to come back to us. If they don't come back to Hopkinton, they're going to go to Westboro, and they're going to go to Grafton, they're going to go somewhere else, all great towns. But there's been a lot of discussion about taxpayer dollars for those that don't support the project being wasted on the project. <clears throat> there's no taxpayer dollars being wasted. This is money coming back to us if we go forward. And I think there's a big difference there with some of the understanding that some folks are expressing uh, in the community right now. That and the concept around the undergrounding and the funds for the undergrounding, uh, I think there's confusion there. Uh, I'd rather Mr. Kamala sort of describe what, what we're looking at in terms of undergrounding and how it will be paid for. Uh, but I want to make sure we, we just we need to set the record straight so that we don't confuse people if people are confused it's really our responsibility to fix that um, but we're not going to raise taxes in FY19 or 20 on your property taxes for this project is my understanding it's state and federal funding and with state and federal funding we've all paid into that so this is an opportunity for us to get our money back at the community level not at the household level or the earner level, but at the community level. Yes. Oh, in, 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 in terms of underground, <coughs> uh, the project, project scope now extends from in front of the public safety buildings all the way to Ash Street. All so, the way to what? Ash. Yes, oh. Ash Street. Oh, for undergrounding. Yes. This is different from the project that was considered previously. Previously, we were looking at undergrounding from Wood Street all the way to Wood, uh, to Ash Street. Oh. That's number and one. that's what was voted down at town meeting? In fact, what was voted down at town meeting was the appropriation to fund that. Right. Yes. Uh, we did not have an article specifically looking at whether the project goes forward or not. So in light of the discussion at town meeting, we said, let's scale this back. And the other issue that came up at town meeting was the, <clears throat> the cost of the project. Back then, I think the numbers that were being, being discussed were around $8 million to do that underground project. We've scaled it down. And in addition, through the collective effort of the Board of Selectmen and town staff, we have identified some private funding sources to at least apply towards this project. In the kit, we already have approximately $2.5 million that can be applied to the project. We are also working with Mass DOT to identify a couple of things. Number one, regardless of whether it's an undergrounding project or not, we have argued that having poles at that intersection presents a public safety concern. So we are asking Mass Highway to account for the cost of at least undergrounding at the intersection to address public safety. Uh, that concern was included in our road safety audit. Secondly, as part of this project, if we were not undergrounding, the project will still be required to move the poles uh, further into the sidewalks. There's a cost associated with that. So our argument, our position is that let's take those costs that will be borne, whether there was undergrounding or not, uh, by the project, 
and build them into the underground in cost. The third administrative thing that we have done is to accomplish the undergrounding, we'll be uh, asking utility companies to identify how we move their lines underground. And we have at least we have the support from us DOT that if this project is <coughs> to move forward, we will use a contracting method that will actually reduce the cost. There's going to be one contractor who's going to do this work and that will be done under the must DOT contract. There are some efficiencies in that regard. So that will help lower the cost. Um, the, the numbers that we're looking at right now uh, is that the project may cost $5 million. Dave? The underground, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, five to five and a half. Yes. So we already have about 2.5 million in our hands. And then we're now looking at further adding to that uh, chest. And the remainder, um, if, there's, if, if there's any funding that is required, Mr. Hare, then we'll have to go to town meeting and request town meeting to, to fund that component. There are two ways of doing that. We could request rate payers, who are actually town residents, uh, to fund that component, or we can go to taxpayers in general and ask for an appropriation. So that's where we are in terms of the undergrounding. It's been scaled back. We've identified private funding to mitigate the impact on the town. And we're also continuing to work with MassDOT to find other ways of increasing the private funding for the project. Let me just add one comment specific to the private funding. The private funding is monies that the town of Hockington has received for improvements in the downtown corridor area as part of private developments that have taken place in Hockington over the years. So it's not private funding like the corporation's throwing a million dollars at us. It's private funding that we receive and we're supposed to use per the agreements with the developers to improve this corridor, which is one of the reasons why we are doing this. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything else, Dave? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, the lighting you had mentioned, yeah. you know, all, it all depends on it, you know, if it's an undergrounding project or not, uh, it's considerably different. Um, and there is a, a cost, a portion of that three million, a big, a big portion of it is is lighting. Um, if the utilities go underground, the utility poles go on go away, and our, our you know overhead street lights go away. So we now have to account for street lighting. Um, and as Norman mentioned, we'd go to the historic district, and the intent would to be put put in the period type post lighting um, that have to go on both sides of the street. So it's it's a it's a big part of the, the, the three million dollar. Um, it's it's close to half um, would be for the lighting. So, um, so, so so my thought on the lighting is, and I've been to a lot of these communities around the state, and some of them look great, and some look god awful, because they take these great period lights and they put them every five feet. Yeah. And it just you know it, it may have been the period to have a gas lantern, but I guarantee you they weren't every five feet a hundred years ago. Uh, so I would strongly recommend that we do the absolute minimum street lighting that we have to do in Hockington to keep us safe and not a, whatever it is, foot candle more. Yes. Yeah. In, in, interesting enough, in fact, we, we, we did have some discussion internally on this topic where we were considering the lighting poles that are already at the common. Those are nice, too. Exactly. Town has reviewed those and the town has accepted that design. So th that's the easiest solution for yeah, us. Those, those However, are great. our, our concern is... The quantity is, is a huge piece of it. E exactly. We, we, we did talk about that. The, the only concern is those lights, were, those poles were erected many years ago. They may no longer be available. There's something very similar to that. Very yeah. similar. Yeah. You yeah. won't yeah. notice yeah. the difference yeah. walking yeah. up down the street. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can get that design. I yeah. did lighting for 30 years. So. Thank you. Well, yeah. I just want to say, I mean, to that point, I mean, I would hope going to the historic district that you or whoever actually brings some samples of lighting, you know, cut sheets or something of what what choices there are, because otherwise they're just going to say, well, we'd like something in a period style light. But you know, you need you need to bring some some examples of what we're really talking about here. But um, Mr. Hurst's point about 
downtown Wellesley has so many period lights, it looks like a landing strip. I mean, it, as you said, there are every five lights. You just see this blaze of excessive lighting. So, Dave, you just mentioned there needing to be on both sides of the street. Is that is that a certainty or? Yes. Because currently right now your, your lights are you know, 30 feet up, so they do yeah. provide enough lighting to cover. So, uh, isn't it funny, I can't remember, are the street lights only on one side of the street now? On occasion you might have one oddball Just on the southern side, but most of them are on the southern side of the weeds, road. you guys? Yes, yeah. but as yeah. you go down this path, okay. yeah. the less lighting the better. Hopkinton's okay. been known okay. for okay. low lighting. Yeah, maybe yeah, we're on the planning myself. board. It's always no lighting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, want to, I want to keep Mrs. Altamira happy here, so we want to go as little little, little lighting right. as possible. Yes. Oh, and two, that's Sandy. I hope you're feeling better. Okay. Um. Anything else on town manager's report? I think I'm all set now. Yeah. Excellent. So I think. Uh, I think that's going to do it for us. Future board agenda items. Anything. Anything you want to add to the, to the agenda, Mr. Hur? I think we got plenty on our plate. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually do have one. I had a discussion with a guy named Joe Amorcino this week. Um, Joe is. Guy. Yep. Yeah. And oh, he is in charge of the uh, Boston Celtics summer camp. Um, he, his father was the uh, coach, the basketball coach here. Um, way back and was actually at uh, Walter Brown's funeral. Um, not to get too into it, but they wanted to bring their Celtics camp to Hopkinton summer of 2018. Uh, they hit some roadblocks as far as scheduling goes, but um, I think with a year and a half out, we can do what we, uh, you know, I pointed them towards uh, Parks and Rec and Jay Gelfi and, and, and those guys, but I, it, it sounded like a great opportunity the Celtics players come here it's for a week uh, it's it's a uh, positive revenue for the uh, for the town kids get to work there and uh, I'd like to see what we can do about uh, helping facilitate that thing happen summer 2019 that would have to be through the schools right I don't know that's why I brought it up <laughs> oh, well no no because we know we'll have the uh, center school Mr. Sistari Oh, good. I thought you were going to invite the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> okay. I don't have anything to add. Um, okay. Dad, just looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? None here. None. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And be sure to get to the uh, Center School Reuse uh, meeting uh, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And go Patriots. Oh, yeah. Go Patriots. It's up. All right. Absolutely. Watch the game. Thank you very much. Mike.